Today we're going to talk about ischemia, infarction, and the waveforms Q through U. In part one of this video, we'll review the characteristic EKG patterns of myocardial ischemia and infarction. Then we'll talk about a practical way to look at the waveforms Q through U when you're systematically reading an EKG. We'll go over what exactly you should look for so that you can come to the right diagnosis. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, you can see that this is the algorithm that we've been following with these videos. We've talked about rate, rhythm and intervals, axis and transition, and hypertrophy. And so now we're going to talk about infarction. For this step, though we're calling it infarction, what we're actually doing here is just making sure that we look carefully at each of the remaining waveforms on the EKG just to make sure that we can come up with the right diagnosis. So I like to start by looking for pathologic Q waves, which indicate necrosis from MI. You'll notice here that it says slow down. That's because pathologic Q waves are extremely easy to miss. In fact, I'd estimate that when pathologic Q waves are present on an EKG, there is approximately an 85% chance that the medical student has missed them. Now, interns do a little bit better, and residents do a lot better, but once you start getting to the level of faculty member, I find that the Q wave detection rate can sometimes start getting spotty again. And so for that reason, this is a step that really everyone should slow down for. Next, I look for an S wave in lead 1, which, if present, clues me in to look for an S1, Q3, T3 pattern, which can be seen with right ventricular pressure overload syndromes acute or chronic. However, I find that it's usually a nonspecific finding. Now, if you wanted to skip a step from this algorithm, I think it's okay to skip this one. Next, I look at the ST segments and T waves for abnormalities such as ST elevations, T wave inversions, or peak T waves. We'll talk more about these in a minute. Now, I usually like to eyeball the ST segments and T waves together, though you can look at them separately if you prefer. Alternately, there's a vector method of examining them, though in my experience I find it's much smarter to first develop a solid understanding of the traditional way of looking at ST segments and T waves before moving on to vectors. Now, if you're interested in learning more about vectors, there's a good chance that I've put out a contraband collection of advanced vector videos somewhere, uh, but I'm not at liberty to tell you more. Finally, I finish up the EKG by quickly scanning the precordyleads for U waves, which represent a second hump after the T wave. U waves can become more prominent in conditions such as hypokalemia, bradycardia, and QT prolongation. Now, this is another step that I think it's okay to skip if you prefer. Okay, so now let's go ahead and talk more about ischemia and infarction. So we'll start with some basic definitions. The word ischemia refers to tissue hypoxia due to inadequate coronary blood flow. This can be transient, for example, in a patient who experiences chronic stable angina that's induced by exercise and relieved by rest, or it can be more sustained. Now, on the other hand, myocardial infarction, or MI, indicates necrosis due to severe prolonged ischemia. Now, you should know that the majority of MIs involve the left ventricle. However, inferior MIs, which involve the inferior wall of the left ventricle, can sometimes also involve the right ventricle. Less commonly, MIs involving predominantly the right ventricle can also occur. Now, let's take a look at this simplified depiction of the layers of the ventricular wall. Here's the endocardium on the inside, and here's the pericardium on the outside, and here's the muscular myocardium in between. Now we call the inner layer of the myocardium the subendocardium. The subendocardium is more susceptible to ischemia than the outer layer, which is called the epicardium. Now when the injury is confined to the inner layer, we call it subendocardial ischemia or subendocardial infarction. With subendocardial ischemia or infarction, the most characteristic finding on EKG is a depression of the ST segment, which lies between the QRS complex and the T wave. You can see here that this ST segment is depressed below the baseline, and so we call this ST depression. Now when you have injury that involves the entire thickness of the wall, we call it transmural ischemia or transmural infarction. Transmural infarctions result from sudden total occlusion of a coronary artery, typically due to acute thrombosis superimposed upon an atherosclerotic plaque. Now less commonly, transient transmural ischemia can result from coronary vasospasm, for example, in patients with Prince Metal's angina, which transiently produces EKG changes that are very similar to those of transmural MI. Now, while there are a number of characteristic EKG changes associated with transmural MIs, the most clinically helpful one is ST segment elevation. ST elevation represents an important indication for emergent reperfusion therapy, for example, with percutaneous intervention or with thrombolytic drugs. Thus, in everyday clinical practice, we typically refer to MIs as either being 
ST-segment elevation myocardial infarctions, which are also known as STEMIs, and non-ST elevation myocardial infarctions, which are known as NSTEMIs. Now, it's important to note that patients with MI often lack characteristic findings on the EKG, which is really only one piece of a bigger diagnostic puzzle, along with cardiac enzymes, history, physical, and other diagnostic tests. That said, when you're able to quickly identify an acute ST elevation MI in a patient with a compelling clinical picture, it's incredibly helpful and can potentially save the patient's life. Now, while blood tests like troponins can help clinch the diagnosis at MI, they unfortunately take too long to come back positive. And when they do come back positive, it tells you that significant death of the myocardium has already occurred. Now, the terms Q-wave MI and non-Q-wave MI are also occasionally used to describe MIs based on whether or not they're associated with pathologic Q-waves. I should say, however, that this classification is less helpful in the acute setting because it doesn't convey a whole lot about management. Q-waves, which indicate myocardial necrosis, are more likely to develop in patients with transmural infarction, though they can sometimes also be seen with subendocardial MI. Nonetheless, persistent Q waves on an EKG reflect a loss of normal positive forces in the region of the infarction. Thus, they indicate significant structural heart disease and confer a much worse prognosis. Now let's talk about the typical evolution of EKG findings with transmural infarction, or at least how it's described in the textbooks. Note that in real life, it's common for some of these things to not appear or to evolve in a different way, especially in patients who undergo timely reperfusion. So in the acute phase of a transmural infarction, the major findings are hyperacute T waves, ST segment elevations, and Q waves. Hyperacute T waves, which are T waves that are tall in amplitude, are the earliest EKG finding. It's common to not see these on the EKG as they typically only present during the first several minutes after an MI, and they're rarely present for more than an hour into it. Note that hyperacute T waves are sometimes confused with the peak T waves of hyperkalemia. However, with MI, they tend to appear in the leads corresponding to the infarct related artery and they evolve into ST segment elevations. In hyperkalemia, on the other hand, the peak T waves are generally more diffuse. Next, ST segment elevations also develop early on during transmural MI, typically within minutes to hours, but they persist longer than hyperacute T waves. And finally, pathologic Q waves start to develop though this happens in a more variable kind of way, and so they can appear within the first one to two hours, or they can develop later on, even 24 hours later. Pathologic Q waves indicate myocardial necrosis, in other words, tissue that has died due to the MI. An easy way to understand why they develop is to just observe that when a region of myocardium dies, it becomes electrically silent, while the remaining force of depolarization are oriented away from it. Thus, if you looked in a lead corresponding to the infarcted area, you'd notice a more negative deflection. This is our Q wave. Now, as the MI evolves, early on, the T waves become inverted, usually within the first few hours. Then, the ST segments flatten, also usually within the first few hours. And eventually, the T waves return to baseline. This can sometimes happen quickly, or it can take a while. Q waves, which represent a myocardial scar, tend to stick around much longer. They can slowly resolve over time, or they can persist for years. Now, in the acute setting, patients having transmural MI, as well as some patients with non-transmural infarcts, are also at risk of developing potentially fatal arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Patients can also develop AV blocks, which can slow or block the conduction of impulses from the atria to the ventricles. Now we'll talk more about arrhythmias and AV blocks later, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of EKG complications you can see with major MIs. Now other EKG findings that are associated with ischemia and infarction include ST depressions. As we mentioned earlier, ST depressions are seen with subendocardial ischemia and infarction. Now while you can see them during an acute event, you can also see them during transient ischemia. For example, during a cardiac stress test, we hook the patient up to an EKG and we look to see if we can induce ST depressions using a stressor such as exercise or medication. And T wave inversions can also be seen during acute ischemia or infarction. Now, sometimes the T waves can look biphasic like this one. Biphasic or deep T wave inversions in the anterior leads, especially leads V2 and V3, are a feature of the Wellens syndrome which is characterized by severe disease of the left anterior descending artery, and it predicts a high risk of developing an anterior wall MI. Now, I should mention that most patients who present with an MI have a non-ST elevation MI, 
Thus, in a patient having an MI, you're much more likely to find things like ST depressions or T-wave inversions than you are any of these other findings we talked about earlier. That said, ST depressions and T-wave inversions are extremely nonspecific, and there are a host of other things that can produce them. Now, practically speaking, it's more helpful to familiarize yourself with the appearance of common EKG patterns than it is to memorize lists of things that can produce ST segment or T-wave changes. That said, I'll list just a few important alternate etiologies for ST depressions and T-wave inversions. Some non-ischemic causes of ST depressions include secondary repolarization abnormality, which is sometimes seen with long-standing ventricular hypertrophy and which is always seen when the QRS complex is wide, for example with a bundle branch block. Digoxin and a few other medications can also produce ST depressions. Severe hypokalemia can sometimes produce marked ST depressions as well as U-waves, which we'll talk about later. Critical illness and a number of other conditions are also associated with ST depressions. This is just a small list here. Now, important non-ischemic causes of prominent T-wave inversions include an acute CNS process such as stroke or intracranial bleed, also secondary repolarization abnormality due to long-standing hypertrophy or bundle branch block, other causes of ventricular pressure overload or strain, such as pulmonary embolism or apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Additionally, certain metabolic disturbances, such as hypokalemia, can cause deep T-wave inversions. Critical illness and a number of other conditions are also associated with prominent T-wave inversions. Note that T-wave inversions can be normal. For example, in young patients, it's common to see inverted T-waves in the right precordial leads, especially leads V1 and V2. Also, T-wave inversions are expected to be seen in lead AVR because it's the opposite of everything else, and they're usually normal in leads 3 and V1. We'll talk more about this later. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at an example EKG. Let's start with this one. So eyeballing this tracing, what jumps out at you as looking very abnormal? So you'll notice that there are prominent ST elevations in some leads, and deep ST depressions in other leads. So what's going on here? Is it subendocardial ischemia or an ST elevation MI? Well, when you have both ST elevations and ST depressions, the ST elevations which are more concerning are usually the primary process. Thus, this is an example of an acute inferior ST elevation MI. Now, it's important that when you call something an MI, you don't just call it an acute MI, but you go ahead and mention where it's localized. And so in this case, this is an inferior MI because the ST elevations are most prominent in leads 2, 3, and AVF. Now, the ST depressions we see here in the lateral leads, leads 1 and AVL, are what we call reciprocal ST depressions or reciprocal changes. To understand why we get these, let's take a look at our hexaxial diagram. So let's say you had a QRS complex that looked like this in lead 3. How do you think it would look in lead AVL? which is nearly opposite to lead 3. Well, because lead AVL is on the opposite side, the QRS deflection would look like an inverted mirror image, and so it would be very positive, kind of like this. Now let's say you had an inferior ST elevation MI. If you looked in lead 3, your waveforms might look like this, where you have a deep Q wave and prominent ST elevations. Now, how do you think the waveform would look on the opposite side in leads AVL and 1? Well, on the opposite side, you'd see an inverted mirror image that kind of looks like this, where the Q wave is now an R wave, and the ST elevation is now an ST depression. So these ST depressions represent our reciprocal changes. Notice that they're not really changes at all. They're simply just a reflection of the primary process that we're seeing on the other side. So with inferior ST elevation MIs, you get reciprocal ST depressions here in the lateral leads, and with lateral ST elevation MIs, you get reciprocal ST depressions on the opposite side in the inferior leads. Reciprocal ST depressions are a characteristic feature of ST elevation MIs. When you see these, it tells you that the ST elevations you see on the other side are the real thing, and they're not some more benign cause of ST elevations such as the early repolarization pattern, which we'll talk more about later. Now you might have also noticed these prominent ST depressions in leads V2 and V1. Since we know that this patient is having an ST elevation MI, we know that these deep ST depressions are likely reciprocal to something else. So what do you think is going on here? What's the diagnosis? Well, if you're particularly astute, you might have figured out that this is not just another plain old inferior ST elevation MI, but instead this is an infero posterior ST elevation MI. Now to understand how we got to posterior, remember that leads V1 and V2 sit by the sternum and are located anteriorly to the heart. 
So let's say you put a precordial lead on the patient's back directly opposite to them. If you looked in this lead, you would expect to see an inverted mirror image of what's going on in leads V2 and V1. Thus, in this case, the ST depressions we see in leads V2 and V1 actually reflect an ST elevation MI that's also involving the posterior wall of the left ventricle. Similarly, the tall R waves likely represent an inverted reflection of deep Q waves. And I should say that posterior MIs are tricky to diagnose, and so it's okay if you just call this an inferior MI. Now, while you can occasionally have a posterior MI that involves only the posterior wall of the left ventricle, it's more common for posterior MIs to be infraposterior or posterolateral, depending on the infarct-related artery and the patient's coronary anatomy. Okay, let's go ahead and stop there for part one. In part two, we'll take a look at a couple of more example tracings, and then we'll talk about how to put all of this stuff together in a practical way when you're reading an EKG. And so we'll talk about things like how to diagnose a Q wave, or what exactly is a U-wave. And so adios muchachos, see you next time.